Hi everybody, this is Andrea Shabaglian with Just a Girl Made for Mission. I am so glad you are here listening to Motherhood, an Honest Look, part three. Again, we had such incredibly powerful, heartwarming stories that we had to divide it to not lose the, the love and, and vulnerability behind each story. So today you get to hear from Chelsea as she shares the loss of her mother at a young age and what struggles that looks like in her daily life today as she moves forward. Get to hear from my friend Amy and, and the judgment that came from another woman in sharing her struggles and vulnerability at the loss of a child. And from Darina as she shares how we all grieve differently when it comes to loss. And as Jana shares the struggles in, in navigating the journey of a child that she lost while also raising her other children and being present and investing with them. And my dear sister, Kina, who talks about being a young mother, raising foster kids and the generational blessings that she has. And then you get to hear from Dominica's Kristen as they share moments when they realized that, that they needed they needed a community, they needed a maternal community. So I'm so grateful for them and their willingness to open up their lives and hearts to us. And would you lean in and listen as they share with us a moment that helped them bridge empathy or gave themselves empathy or empathy for others. What is a defining moment that changed you or allowed you to grow empathy for yourself and or others? Or finding out I was pregnant at 17, uh, my senior year was a defining moment that changed my life as um, it instantly made me become an adult. And I knew that I owed it to my birth mother to to have my baby. And so I had empathy for my birth mother thinking, gosh, man, I'm 17 in high school. She was 12 in grammar school. Like, who am I? I'm wise enough to, to do this. Uh, my mother, you know, who who raised me and, and my siblings, um, you know, just out of un her unconditional love for wanting to be a mother without having, bearing any children was um, a defining moment for me in life when I made the decision to, to become a mother. Um, my conversation with my daughter, when she told me that she was pregnant and she was 22. And so it just kind of just took me all the way back, like full circle again, like, okay, I made the decision to be responsible and to be a young mother at 17, but my motivation was my birth mother who had me at 12, and my and my uh, and my most motivation was my mother who who's my mother, my everything, my best friend who taught me the pro life, um, and I was you know raised in the church and faith based, um, taught that life is a gift, it's precious. And then I also realized that as, you know, her not only adopting me and my brother and my sister, but she also fostered uh, children. And then I was a foster mother. And um, so all of those moments were defining moments in motherhood in different phases of my journey in life and made me have more empathy in regards to people's situations because we were all all of our situations were different and all of them are challenging, but together it, with love, love connects and, and it makes it all right. And so that those are my defining moments. I don't know how you could expect to, like, I was just going to say, I didn't expect to lose my baby, but who, who does, right? So um, it was devastating. It, um, devastating. And um, I ha have always wanted to be a mom, always. Um, I spent hours as a kid writing down names for my children, you know, and mixing and matching the first names with the middle names and the, um, I never used any of them though, by the way, which is so funny. Um, anyways, so I was so excited when 
you know, I got pregnant really quick and so excited, lots of hopes, lots of dreams. And they were dashed, you know, almost like in an instant, it felt like, and, um, it took a long time for me to heal. And, um, I think going through pregnancy loss is a very lonely experience. Um, people want you to move on. They want you to be okay. They don't ever talk about it. So it's like your baby is forgotten. Um, so I found this really great support group and um, loved it, loved it. And there was an activity night one night and so, and it was a mixing of the day group and the night group. And so I actually was the only one from my group that was going. And I met this other woman for the first time that night and she asked me about my loss. And so I, I told her that I lost my baby at 11 weeks. And the only way I can describe the way she looked at me, it was, it was a cut combination of contempt and disgust and and said that my baby was stillborn you were barely pregnant and in that moment i i really felt that oh my gosh should i not should i not be grieving do is there like a a time period that right and it took me a long time. I carry it with me now because when I look back, I still think about that baby. It's been 16 years and I still think about it. And I still think, what would he or she be doing? Um, you know, and then kind of all the other questions that come along. And I had a friend who was pregnant at the same time. And so when I see her son, I think that could have been you know, my child. Um, so I think that that experience really, really shaped me. I mean, when it influenced my, my next pregnancies a lot with my, with my mental state, but you know, for me, I was pregnant. It didn't matter if I was four weeks or 44 weeks, I was pregnant. I had hopes. I had dreams for this baby. Um, and so from that moment, it, it, you know, my journey has taken me lots of different places. And I, and I think what I've learned along the way is that from that moment, that was my experience, right? And whatever experience someone has, whether it's tragic or traumatic or, you know, happy or uh, amazing, that's what it is. If they say that's what it is, that's what it is. And that's how we need to look at it if we are going to walk with them. Right? We can't judge their experience. We can't compare. One of my favorite sayings is comparison is the thief of joy. And I and I repeat that. It's almost like a mantra that I say to myself when I catch myself um, comparing to um you know, the, the perfect highlight reels that I see on social media or, you know, what I see just on TV. Um, but the same goes for those really hard experiences that, you know, just cause it's not as bad as someone else doesn't mean it's not bad. Um, I had a friend, my senior year of high school, my mom got sick later in the year. Um, uh, at some point during the year, we, you know, you start going to like some of the senior rallies or whatever. And it was in the fall. And I remember her uh, being like melancholy and um, just in this daze. And I was like, what is wrong with you? And she was like, I just miss my dad right now. And I was like, that was like two months ago. And she just looked at me and she's like, you just don't get it. I remember moving past that moment. So like a year after my mom had passed away, her and I were having coffee. And I was like, I'm so sorry. Like, I didn't get it. I just didn't get it. And she's like, I didn't want you to get it. I also didn't want you to feel what I felt. And it's okay. 
And I was like, ah. like on one hand, you know, I felt like a horrible human being. But on the other hand, it was like this moment of connection for us of going, there's something about pain um, and shared pain that unites people. And now today, uh, her dad and my mom have headstones two away from each other. And every time I go visit my mom, I always send her a picture like of her dad's or I'll, you know, clean off her dad's or whatever and vice versa. And that gives a deeper level of empathy and understanding that you can't really grasp until you've experienced some, some sort of life experience that is shaking you to the core. Uh, I don't know what triggered you. I, I don't know what exactly you're feeling right now, but I know it's okay to let you sit in it. I know it's okay to not push you out of it. I know it's okay uh, for you to feel what you're feeling. And I know that it's also possible for both to exist. And I was actually sitting with a friend on uh, the tailgate of my, my husband's truck the other day and we were talking and she was struggling uh, understanding some conflicting feelings in her heart. Cause her, she had just lost her mom and, and is going through some stuff. And I sat there and I, it was one of those moments where you like have an epiphany, you know, of your own life. And you're like, Oh gosh. Um, but we were talking and I was like, you know, it's possible to embrace both. And I was like, thinking about my wedding day, I was so happy and I was marrying the love of my life. And yet I sobbed gut-wrenching tears because I desperately craved for my mom to help put on my wedding dress. And I desperately wanted her to be there watching me get my makeup done. And I wanted her to meet the man I was marrying. And it was this moment of realizing I had such deep sorrow with also the most exhilarating joy and happiness. And they both existed in the same heart and in the same mind and in the same body in the same moment. And that's who I am. And they're, they're not separate. And there's moments where I may feel one more than the other. And there's moments where people may need to sit in a, in a feeling more than the other, but that doesn't make the fact that they're laughing uh, separate from the fact that they're also grieving something else. This understanding that, yes, they both exist. And that's okay. So let me meet you where you're at today in this moment. Let me meet you with whatever you're feeling in this moment. And let me also celebrate in five seconds when that changes. Or in five months when that changes. Uh, it's a journey and it's a process. It's not an end date. And it's not a, it has to be by this moment and it'll never occur again. It's, it's an ongoing wave and that's okay. I had four daughters and my oldest daughter was diagnosed with cancer at age six and we lost her at age 11 and a half. Raising a family during that time, three other small children, um, when your life is revolved around cancer treatments and hospitalizations and surgeries and and all of that um, definitely had its challenges uh, when I think back though on that time I also know that that was the time in my life that I truly felt the closest to God so much of our lives is about us controlling what's happening and when you're faced with a situation like that you don't have that control anymore and when that's taken away there's just nowhere else to look but to look up and so for us during that time our faith grew um, and um, Towards the end of Shauna's life, she had a very deep faith herself. And so um, even though she was 11 and a half, she was much older than that. When, when I think about empathy and, and what that journey for us taught us is I do think that for me, it taught me to have empathy for other people and to, I always tell people that they shouldn't minimize their own challenges you know some people say oh well I didn't lose a child you know or, and I'm like but their challenges are still going to um, you know cause pain and hurt and struggles in their life and so I think for me that going through that helped me to become much more empathetic to other people and what their struggles are going through grief yourself 
your husband going through grief. It's kind of like two drowning people trying to save each other. And so the, the issues that you have in your marriage while you're going through that, and then also trying to be supportive and love on your own children as they're grieving and how they all grieve so differently. The other thing that happens is as children age, they re-grieve as they experience and understand death differently. So when I might have gotten to a point where, okay, I'm doing a little better, or I mean, grief is just kind of in waves. Sometimes you're doing better and then out of the blue, 24 years later, you can be hit and knocked over. So, um, but as even as I was, you know, healing in, in growing, getting better myself, my kids might have gone, started to go through it all over again. So as a mom walking alongside of them as they're going through. Always my biggest goal as a mom was wanting them to not be mad at God necessarily, to to still love God, even though he took his sister, their sister. And um, so even at her memorial service with all of the children, because you know my kids were all in elementary, we had a lot, and Shauna was a spokesperson for the blood center. So we had a lot of children, a lot of people at her service. Our goal was always to bring glory to God through it and that they would see us better, not bitter because of the journey that we went through. Looking through this and you know, obviously for me, the most defining moment actually happened in 2014 when my husband was diagnosed with cancer. We knew that he had something going on and we were trying to get testing for several months, um, but we found out in May of that year that he had stage four melanoma cancer. And we received that diagnosis like a sucker punch to the gut. We had absolutely no idea that was coming. We were blindsided by it. We had a full summer ahead of us. Our daughters were ages two, five, and eight at that time. And so that has defined my mothering because it required so much of me as I learned how to grieve myself. Um, my husband went to, he to heaven in September of that year. So just three short months later, I was navigating grief for myself. And then also trying to come alongside my daughters who were very young and to navigate grief with them. I really hunkered down with my kids, became a stay at home mom. We learned how to grieve together. The thing about grief is that depending on your cultural background um, and the way that you are raised, some people want you to get over grief quickly. I think that's very common in American culture, but I didn't necessarily see that as being biblical and my faith is strong and I go to God's word as my guide. And so not because I had any background in grief therapy or psychology or any of those things that I think might have helped me, but only because I had God guiding me was that I learned how to give myself permission to grieve and how to give my girls permission to grieve. For me, part of doing the work of grief was actually operating within community. It was learning how to celebrate my husband's life. And so we have a big fat uh, party at our house every September 9th to celebrate his life and his legacy. And we eat good food and we tell stories about him. Well, that is very particular to my personality. That is not at all how my mother-in-law, for example, grieves. And I respect her for that. So those are some of the things that God taught me through that defining moment. It's a journey that we're still on. We're six years out. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'm remarried. And so we're learning how to navigate that with my new husband who happened to be um, one of my late husband's best friends. In that time, I've also grown a lot of empathy for my daughters. I've seen God grow a sense of grit and resilience in them as they have learned how to give themselves permission to grieve as they have just entered into their own story with that. And so that looks really different for my youngest who was two when she lost her daddy and is now eight. And then my oldest who was eight when she lost her daddy and is now 14. About a week after my husband's funeral, um, some friends, dear friends invited us to go to a concert and we were just enjoying the worship music. We were just singing. 
I was watching my little girls dance with their friends and it was just a sweet time of connecting with the Lord. Um, you know, pretty fresh in our grief. God used that music for us in a really powerful way. And then afterwards, I saw a friend of mine who came up to me and just basically like threw herself on me sobbing. And it was in that moment, and I don't blame her at all for being that way. I am so actually appreciative that she would have that kind of grief and want to share it with me. Um, but I but I realized in that moment that there was this weird expectation on me as a widow. Because in that moment, I wasn't in the throes of sadness. Now that's not to say that I didn't cry every single day after my husband died, but I just wasn't in that place of emotion. And I went home thinking, wow, what are people thinking about me when they see me in public and I'm not crying that way? Or I am experiencing joy with my daughters or I am unusually quiet because I'm in a hard grief day. The things that God was allowing and giving me permission to do and how he was ministering to my spirit as I was grieving. And what were the things that were expectations about grief that seemed to be kind of pressing in on me. And the, again, the same thing with my girls. I had to, to sort of be protective for them. And so I had to learn how to be courageous as a mom and say, no, my kids actually have permission to be sad right now. Um, or even they have permission to, to be silly and to celebrate um, when culturally maybe it's a time when we should be grieving. So for example, at my husband's funeral, we had bounce houses. <laughs> And it was a suggestion of his best friend who was helping me with the service. And he said, you know what? His life touched so many young people. There's going to be so many kids at this funeral because my, my girls were going to be there ages two, five and eight. And so he said, I know what Eric Lee would have loved is he would have loved people to celebrate. He's like, how do you feel about this? And I, I never would have thought of it myself because I thought, oh, this is like socially not acceptable to have bounce houses at a funeral. But we did, and the thing that my daughters remember about that day is that we celebrated their daddy together, and that their friends played with them. Their friends showed up. And so that was an expression of our grief that maybe for some people <laughs> is not acceptable, but, but we learned to live into who we were, who we are, and who my husband was, and his like is city. It's been so many moments. I would, I would think back to, um, I was about five months pregnant with my daughter and it had came to that point where I realized that I'll be going into the rest of my pregnancy alone and potentially raising her alone. And it was me really leaning on my faith and, and putting down some of my pride because I had felt like, look, I got myself in this situation. Um, this is my own responsibility. I don't need any help. Um, I got this, but it came to a point where I needed some help. And so um, um, I moved in with my grandmother and it was just the amount of uh, love and reassurance that I wasn't doing it alone and had a strong support system. And it made me um, grateful and um, I wasn't so afraid knowing that um, that I, I had help, you know, it wasn't so bad and uh, having that guidance um, and me, um, in tune, like returning that and being grateful. And so, um, it's just, um, having a community where you're not alone and people supporting you. And so in tune, um, that's just how it's been working for me. It's just been a bridge of just a community of people. Um, they say it takes a village to raise a child. And I really utilize every person in my village to, um, help me as a mother, um, mother, my daughter, because she's like the next generation, you know, it's just a big responsibility. You know, I lost my mother um, when I was a teenager, fresh out of high school, on the brick of independence. And um, so when I had my daughter, um, yeah, I just, I, I idolized the relationship me and my mother had because we were the best of friends. and. And then I was a little bit worried of like, well, how much time do I have until, you know, she's in high school to like mother her and nurture her. And then 
will my time come to an end where I won't be there? Will she be able to self-sustain and everything? Am I teaching her the right skills to live on if, if I'm not around, you know? And so those things kind of play a part of, because I miss my mother and it was a whole bunch of, you know, of course I do. And there's a whole bunch of things I wish she could have been around for and help me mother and be a grandmother to my daughter and stuff like that. So I have a really good French relationship with my daughter as a friend and a mother. Um, I'm an adult child of divorce. So uh, the youngest of five kids and along with that, it kind of came to the forefront and obviously um, looking back on it now as a mom and an adult, a lot of unaddressed pain and hurt really did lead to the forefront some damaging behavior on the part of my own mom and her relationship with me. And so um, it became really evident that my mom was struggling with alcohol um, and uh, managing that addiction, which was something that I didn't know or wasn't aware of even prior to uh, those first 20 some odd years. She wasn't necessarily a resource at that time as I was getting um, newly acquainted with being in a marriage relationship. There just wasn't that free line to like pick up and phone a, phone a mom or phone a friend kind of thing. And um, I realized that I, it seems so ridiculous, um, but at you know 21, I didn't know how to clean a kitchen. I didn't know how to clean a lot of things. And so you know, having this opportunity to move into this new place and it needed definitely to get cleaned up. And so I went to the grocery store and I went to the cleaning aisle. I'm in this aisle trying to figure out, okay, what do I need? Like what kind of cleaners? And um, I'm assuming that as moms, we are familiar with the cleaning aisles of, of grocery stores. And there's a lot of stuff there. And even 20 years ago, there was a lot of stuff in those aisles. And I remember being really overwhelmed. And I didn't know like what cleaning products per se cleaned what. Um, and so I remember grabbing every, every cleaning product in the section that um, I was looking at. Actually, I think it might have even been bathrooms, not kitchens. But I, and I remember sitting on the floor of this Vons, in um, our local Vons, and laying out, I had more than seven bottles like in front of me, and I had all the backs, you know, so you could like read the directions. And I was sitting there reading, and um, I mean, talk about just kind of like a research mentality, but I was like, oh, I'm just gonna research this thing. But in, in the midst of that, I think I got to like maybe bottle two, and I just lost it. Like I was sitting there in a, in a grocery store reading the backs of bottles. And I just remember thinking like, man, what I would give to be able to just call my mom, you know? And I think, I think the reality of that is that we never stop wanting or longing for that connection, that maternal connection. I don't think it really matters if you are 5, 15, or 55, you know, but I think there's just this innate built in us that that longs for our parents in some capacity, even when we know that they aren't healthy in that time or season, even if we know that um, they cannot give what we so desperately need to take, you know, um, so I remember sitting there and looking at the backs of those bottles and just kind of having that moment. I remember um, thinking, gosh, like, I just don't want this for my kids, you know? And I don't think that, you know, obviously in that, in that moment um, that that was the intention of my own mom. Matter of fact, I've told many people that my mom um, was a wonderful mom. Um, I had a fantastic childhood growing up. Um, and there was just that trigger moment. You know, there are moments when we don't deal with pain, when we don't deal with hurt, but they build and they build and they build until, you know, depending on your personality and situation until it, it manifests, it always comes out. You know, it, it, we say things like your nonverbals bleed what you mean. I think that it's kind of the same sense of that like, you know, we're designed, our spirit bleeds truth. The truth of who we are you know it gets it kind of comes into the light um even if we work really hard to mask it that that grief or that pain can mean something that it wasn't meaningless and it wasn't necessarily something that was just about me but the reality is is that there's a lot of us who um feel overwhelmed 
by the lack of resources, or we feel overwhelmed by our own lack of knowledge um, on how to clean a kitchen or a bathroom, to you know how to um, how to soothe a child without losing your own calm or cool, to how to um, communicate that you have uh, needs without feeling selfish and guilty for it. To you know, there's just so many things that you know. That, and realizing there are really limited resources um, for me in my life, uh, especially two decades ago. It, it was in Titus, I think it's like in the second chapter, and he's just asking women, like older women, to um, to like guide younger women to be to be purposed, to to be um, able to like walk alongside younger women and show them how to like embrace their life and really even their hardships. Right, like this idea of like that—that that there is this innate desire to be guided, um, or maybe not even desire. There's an innate need to be guided, and so just confronting that need that day in the grocery aisle and realizing like I wanted to be guided so desperately and didn't have that, and that kind of changed something in me, and it really did. Without knowing, kind of became the start of of um, maybe a, a right expectation for motherhood that it's not about being perfect, it's not about being good enough, um, it's not about being right enough or knowing enough, just being present. You know, I work really hard to be honest with my kids and be present. I, you know, they want to share something, I'm going to stop and listen. Um, and sometimes that means that I am listening to hours of, of um, synopsis on the, the newest TikTok dance um, or YouTube video um, or what happened on a show that I watched with them. But, you know, just creating relationship. And that I think is invaluable. And I learned that sitting on my grocery store floor with, you know, multiple bottles of cleaning um, agents. <laughs> wow, what incredible lives do we get to have the privilege to kind of see have a sneak peek in. I'm so grateful for these women and for them sharing a part of their story with us. And I hope you will lean in with us um, in Motherhood Part 4 as they share um, something they're grateful for. Despite it all, um, they have really tremendous hearts and I'm so glad we get to see that part as well.